One male and one female in Darwin is more than sufficient to populate the entire top end of the Northern Territory. The best thing is to get rid of them, get a big stick and hit them at it. The practice of uh, going out and getting one of these things and putting them into a billy, boiling it down and eating the residue, I think is absolutely repulsive. When I'm driving a car, I have no hesitation at running over them whatsoever. I couldn't do without them. They're friends. <laughs> The situation really became desperate in the early 1930s due to the combined effect of grab attack and the uh, effect of the depression on the world price of sugar. So uh, something had to be done to uh, control of the grab if at all possible. Montgomery was our entomologist at the time and he was sent over to Hawaii to uh, get a colony of toads together and bring them back to Australia and establish a colony in North Queensland. This he did very effectively. Over the long period, of course, it was necessary to keep moisture up to the toads in their crate to keep them alive. They couldn't feed them during the two-week trip that they would be uh, experiencing getting down to Sydney from Hawaii. And then, of course, another two days to get them to uh, Moringa in North Queensland before they could be put into a pond, into an environment that they could relish. Montgomery treated them very, very well. He built a very elaborate pool at Moringa with running water to uh, encourage them to breathe and they responded to his treatment and they began to breathe uh, very vigorously. Yes, I got vivid memories when the toads were first brought to this place. They were brought here by a fellow called Eust in a couple of dishes. There's about 40 toads in, in number in all and they were released in this particular spot over there. And of course, my dad was an Irishman and uh, he was very, very pleased and he was jubilant about the whole affair. And uh, more so that he said this, and I quote, we've got these bloody grubs by the balls this time and we'll go on to bigger and brighter things. But tragically, we didn't have the grubs by the balls, they had us by the balls. Amplexus is a sexual act where the male grasps the female, but of course first he's got to get his female. And after the rains, when you have big areas of temporary water, fresh water, the males will gather around the ponds and they'll call. And the call, of course, attracts the female. And it goes something like this. I suppose the female picks the best or the sweetest of those calls. And when she approaches close, the male will then grasp her into amplexus. And he does that by getting his forearms, which you'll notice are very, very strong, and he pushes them into the side just under the ribs. And on the thumb there is a nuptial pad. This nuptial pad is very, very sticky so that when he pushes the um, thumbs and his hands into the side of her abdominal cavity, the grip is very, very strong and firm. Of course, it's important that this grip be strong so that he doesn't fall off and so that other males too can't push him off. She takes him into the water and she exudes the eggs in long strands. And as they come out, the male releases sperm into the water, which then fertilises the eggs. 
and these eggs are either wrapped around vegetation, but usually it's just left to float in the water. One cane toad female can lay up to 40,000 eggs in a summer. That's a large number of eggs. The theory going that they need the 40,000 just so two can survive to replace the female and the male. But if you see ponds where cane toads have been breeding, more than two survive. The sides of the ponds are just black with young cane toads. And from what I can see, a large number of those survive. The eggs stay in the water and then they start dividing and eventually they start to look like small tadpoles within the egg sac. The tadpoles, when they get sufficiently developed, start wriggling and they rupture the egg sac and they go into the water as tadpoles. And the tadpole is a very distinctive tadpole. It's glossy black. No other Australian frog has a glossy black tadpole. And then in the water for about four, five weeks, it develops. The back legs come out, and then finally the front legs. Then the tail is reabsorbed and they move onto the land as small toads. Well, they've been here for 50 years or a bit more. And look, there's just millions of them in this river. There's certainly no shortage of cane toads in the area. They have a tremendous success rate. Equally interesting is that these tadpoles, if you look at them very carefully, some of them are beginning to get legs. And they do that at a very, very small body size. Uh, the native tadpoles have to get much, much larger than these little fellas. And so they have to stay in the water a little bit longer than what a cane toad can. They weren't much use at all as far as the cane beetle was concerned, but they did manage to get rid of a lot of stray dogs. The dogs would uh, be attracted to these moving toads and grab them, and of course the buffalo merino's only protection was his poison sack, and he used to let the dogs have it, and eventually they, quite a few dogs died. <coughs> love the animal and they give me a lot of enjoyment. Well as you see now I have quite a few which I attract by using a light which is not very powerful which attracts insects and also occasionally I feed them with scats. Well, I started feeding toads whiskets because they started robbing the cat's dish of whiskets. So I used to put dishes of whiskets out. And they didn't come inside. So everybody was happy. <laughs> I definitely think they're a harmless animal 
and nobody's got any right to fear about them. They're mates, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> we often see them mating right here in front of us on the lawn. They are a magnificent animal. If you just take the care and watch them and just see how they act under different circumstances. They're just friends. They are harmless and uh, they jump, they jump on us, jump on my feet and they have no fear at all of uh, coming near me or anybody that's with me. As a mammologist, I always had um, native animals around me that I was studying all the time. And I had a western native cat that was effectively a pet. It had been with us for about five years and had been very important to me as a study animal. The moment we got to Brisbane, I let the thing out into the backyard, as I was accustomed to doing. It had the, the run of the outside and the inside. And the first thing it did, it rushed over and grabbed what, to me, in the dark, looked like a gigantic frog. Never even thought about what it was. And I didn't think anything more about it than that. That's a natural thing for a native cat to do. But about um, two minutes later, the animal was obviously in some kind of trouble. It was beginning to sort of stick its tongue out and salivating, rolling around on the ground. Within 20 minutes, that beautiful, unique animal, which I can only say I was, in, I was totally in love with, this was, a, this was something I was really wrapped up in, died in my arms in technic contraction. If you were to press these glands, well, you should cover your eyes with glasses if you're going to engage in this type of activity. Then, if you were to press these glands here, there, you can see the venom shoot out, did you? There are numerous pores over those glands now. Uh, under pressure, that uh, toxic material will uh, shoot for uh, about a metre. All in all, it's a, quite a cocktail of uh, compounds, toxic compounds, and uh, I think that people would do well to take care when handling uh, toads. Hello? Oh, hi, Wendy. Oh, good. We've just been... After all, people have been killed as a result of uh, eating toads, both in Fiji and in the Philippines. There are uh, well-recorded instances. Taken Eddie down there a couple of times. Oh, oh, oh. As far as children are concerned, I think that uh, toads could be a real problem, particularly with babies. Okay, bye. Children being what they are will um, inevitably uh, squeeze the toads and probably put them in their mouths and suck them and so forth. All the results could be quite disastrous. The death of my native cat led me into a kind of an eternal revenge against the cane toads when I began to come to grips with what was going on here. And every time I ended up in the bush somewhere in North Queensland, um, I felt there was a bit of responsibility here to reduce toad numbers. So I was running around um, at night and I actually hit one of these cane toads with my geology pick. And hence it's all my fault what happened, but nevertheless it's an unforgettable experience. The, the moment I, my pick hit the back of the toad, the toad was instantly dead. But I felt like somebody in turn had hit me right in the face with a baseball bat. Or, or like a bee had stung me in the eyeball. It was the most excruciating pain. I'd been hit in the eye by the, the material jettisoned out of the gland of this toad. And it was fully about six hours before I could actually begin to see out of that eye again. It, it, it's, it's a dreadfully incapacitating experience and one I would not want to go through ever again. When we first came up north, 
we had friends that had two little girls. And uh, these little girls had cane toads as pets. Instead of little dollies, they had these cane toads. They actually had little dresses made up for them, little skirts and beds in a doll's house. They used to dress the toads up and tuck them into their little beds. They used to uh, carry them about, you know, wrapped up in little baby bunting type of things like you do, little dollies. These girls had names for them. They used to set up little tea parties. And they used to get these toads and scratch their tummy and the things that lay back, obviously enjoying it and stick their legs up into the air and, and just fall asleep. And they were the most contented, good little, I suppose, alive little dollies that any girl could like, but just so ugly. If anyone could love a cane toad, it could only be another cane toad. Cause when you love a cane toad, you've got to love him for to know. Hoppy, hoppy, right if your face was like right a cane kiss you, toad, kiss you, and you fall down. He is a, poses as big a menace as the German army did in World War II. The invasion is on and I appeal to everybody. To wherever you see a toad, have no hesitation running over and killing the monster. Well, I really go out of my way to run over cane toads basically because I have a very profound love of the wildlife that occurs here naturally. If it was possible to remove them and totally eradicate them from Australia, and I was capable of doing it, I, I would spend a lifetime doing exactly that. Anyone tried to hurt one of my toads, uh, there'd be a lot of noise and they'd realise I wasn't a lady. <laughs>